can you record as you start? Thank you so much. Um, this morning, we're going to continue talking about the, the very difficult theme of <clears throat> what I call Christians. It's time for you to grow up. Give me everything. It's a very convicting song to me um, because I've, I've mentioned, I've confided in you, I've, I've admitted to you all before that I, I'm, I'm spoiled. Um, and I'm not a prophet. I don't have a prophetic bone in my body, but you're spoiled too. You know how I know? Because I'm about 99.9% .9 sure none of you had to go out and prime a pitcher pump this morning. None of you had to go to an outhouse or empty a honey pot, a chamber pot. Um, and all of you had access to some kind of circulation of air in your house. Most of you have at least one refrigerator and a freezer. And let alone the phones that we carry everywhere in our pockets have enough power. It's got more power than put the men on the moon, if you believe that they put them on the moon. Um, I'm not going to get into that. That was just a joke. Um, <clears throat> but uh, all of us, all of us are spoiled. All of us are spoiled, and I fear, no, I know, that has crept into the church. That has crept into the church, and at one time, it used to be um, rare, but now it is becoming commonplace. And I have found the wi wisest thing to do is to call it out. Um, how many of you all know? What you tolerate, you can't complain about. And as long as you tolerate it, it will continue to happen. Are you listening to me? As long as you tolerate something, it will continue to happen. And, and we, have, we have personal responsibility, and others have personal responsibility, and we've gotten away from taking responsibility for ourselves. Instead of saying, what can I do to make the situation better, we want to find someone to blame. And it's very, 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 very difficult to talk to ourselves. And this morning, I want to continue talking about what the Bible says for just a few weeks. I don't know how long. I guess we'll finish next week. I don't know. Um, with the theme of Christians, it's time to grow up. Um, I, I, we kind of stopped with 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul was talking to the church in the city of Corinth. And he said, I, brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but only as fleshly, as infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to consume it, but even now you're not able. So stop right there. Um, <clears throat> if you missed any of these sermons before, they're on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, type in Goshen New Life. Click subscribe, and most of them have been recorded there for your uh, pleasure to help you go to sleep at night. So I'm not going to belabor a whole bunch of the stuff I've already said before, but <clears throat> I have noticed some patterns in life. Has anyone lived long enough to notice some patterns? And one of the patterns I've noticed is most people will say this in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Miss Kathy will say, well, gosh, if they felt that way, I just wish they'd have told me. That's a lie. Because when you break down and tell somebody stuff like that, they get upset and offended, and, and then they go home and say, I can't believe they said that to me. You can't have it both ways. We, we want to eat our cake and have it too. Ken, you said that wrong. No, I didn't think about what I said. We want to eat our cake and have it too. And the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> and I've used this even in church, you have a knockdown, drag out, old-timey Holy Ghost service, and people come up to you after church and say, Pastor, that was just so wonderful, and the Holy Ghost just got convicting me. And, and, and you know what? If there's something in my life that I shouldn't be doing or I should be doing as a Christian, then, then I feel like you, you need to speak in my life, Pastor. They meant that, but they didn't know what they were asking for. Anybody ever, uh, you know, I, I joke about it, but it's the truth. We all cry at weddings because we can't describe to the couple getting married what they're getting ready to get into. <laughs> right? I mean, marriage is made in heaven, but so is thunder and lightning. Right? And you don't know what you're getting ready to get into. Right? <coughs> so when they say that, see, I, I believed. I didn't know church people lied. 
I won't raised in church. I didn't know church people lie. So, so you say to, 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 to Brother Sam Bucket, well, you remember a few weeks ago? Yeah, Pastor, I remember that. Well, I've noticed the way you talk to your wife and treat your children, and I don't think that's, it lines up with what the Word of God says. And then all of a sudden, they change their mind. You want solid food, but you're, not, but you're barely able to handle the milk. We want, uh, somebody smart said, um, we all have a hunger. Listen to this. I didn't come up with it myself. We have a hunger for truth, but we don't like how it tastes. We have a natural hunger for truth, but we don't like the way it tastes. And Paul, I, you notice it says Corinthians. This is a book in the Bible written to Christians, and he's saying you want me to shut the corn to the cob for you, and you're not even able to drink milk because you're carnal as the day is long. And I'm not here to judge you, but the Bible says, even Jesus said, you can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. None of us here are going to go to a blueberry bush and expect to get strawberries. If you do, you probably need some medicine, okay? That's probably not going to happen. Go to verse 3. Please, did I put it in there? Thank you so much. For you are still fleshly. Christians have this idea of, man, I wish Jesus was my pastor. I wish Paul was your No, you don't. Most of y'all wouldn't come back to church. You get on social media and blast, blast Pastor Paul for how he talked to you. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like ordinary people? Paul is saying you keep coming to church, but you're still acting like you've never been saved. <clears throat> this morning, I'm jumping on where Paul was talking about for all of us, including myself. It's time for us to grow up. We started talking about spiritual babies. It's kind of where we left off was 1 Corinthians 3 and spiritual babies. And spiritual babies are very funny and not like in a ha-ha kind of thing, but spiritual babies are one of the only babies that if they do not want to mature, they, they will not mature. You can put a spiritual baby in the right atmosphere and the right church and the right discipleship program and in the, all the things going for them, but if they refuse to grow up, let me say it like this, you will stay in spiritual kindergarten your whole life if you refuse to grow up. Now, in the natural world, if you're shaving and you're still in kindergarten, they're going to make you go to high school, whether you passed or not. You can't stay in play. And I'm not talking about teach people who can't help themselves. But if you're just too lazy and refuse to pass kindergarten, they're going to make you sit at the high school. They're not going to let you sit in. But God will let you sit in them little bitty desks your whole life. He'll make you sit at the table. He'll make you sit in circle time if you refuse to grow up. And if, you're not a, if you don't recognize what a spiritual baby is, a spiritual baby is someone who says they are saved. But like in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says you're just as mean and ugly as the day is long inside and outside the church. And you need... To grow up, spiritual babies are interested in arguments over action if they don't like something. Spiritual babies are interested in argument over action if they don't like something. I'm talking about some characteristics. The Corinthian church was full of envy, strife, and division. Acting like little children when they should have been growing up carnal as the day is long and only able to handle the milk of Christianity. They should have been able to use their infectious nature as Christians to make disciples and bring others to the saving grace of the gospel of Jesus, but they were unable to move in that direction because they were paralyzed by constant strife, disputes, and blatant disagreements. Just in case you don't know this, I'm going to give you the, a brief synopsis of how Christianity is supposed to work. After you come to a saving knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ and he saves you from your sins, delivers you from your past, you're supposed to, the Bible says repentance is to do a, a 180, completely walk away. So if you got saved and nothing changed in your life, I don't get to be the arbiter of whether you are saved or not, but the Bible says you're not saved. You understand? Now this, this is rough stuff, but hold on with me. 
If you say you got saved and nothing changed, then you need to read your Bible because that's not what the Bible teaches at all. And once you get saved, you now have a responsibility by your actions, words, and deeds to help lead others to Christ, whether you look at them and say, Jimmy, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Sometimes the best sermon people will ever hear is how you act in public. We've joked about it before, but it's the truth. Don't put one of them Christian fish symbols on your car or Goshen G if you're going to drive and give people, tell them they're number one on the road. And I don't mean with this finger either. If you're going to act ugly and cut people off, don't, don't, don't do that. Your actions, words, and deeds say something about your car, your testimony. So the Corinthian church was going through something similar to that. That Paul said, instead of you being able to use your, your Christianity, instead of you using your time wisely, the church is filled with envy, strife, and arguments over actions. And if any time that's ever happened, it's happening in the American church. We're paralyzed by strife, disputes, and blatant disagreements. And just in case you're wondering, no, no one has been, there's no fighting going on behind the scenes at church that I know of at Goshen. So if you're wondering, wow, somebody got Ken all riled up, no, nobody did except the Holy Ghost. So I don't want you to think I'm, I'm hinting or speaking to one particular person or family. Let me tell you about my mentor taught me about that. My mentor taught me several things. He taught me to leave a church better than you find it. He taught me to strive to be above reproach. That if Sister Sam Bucket stands up and blows you out in front of the congregation, people will forget what Sister Sam Bucket says to you. But if you stand in the pulpit and blast her back in the congregation, they will never forget what you say back to her. He also taught me never, ever, ever preach or teach a sermon or a lesson that's, that's pointed towards one particular person or one particular family. He said, um, I think it was President Roosevelt called the, the, the pulpit, he called it the bully pulpit. He said, you don't use the pulpit for that reason. That's inappropriate, and that's really spiritually conduct unbecoming of a minister. And then he jokingly said, but it's true, he said, and if you decide to do that, that's going to be the Sunday they miss. So that, that, you're going you're gonna to preach a whole sermon to somebody who ain't even there. Some of y'all missed that point. I, but it, he said, don't do it. <clears throat> um, but if you're wondering if I'm preaching to you today, I am. Because I'm preaching to myself. It's, it's time. So, so I've told you this before. The Lord has asked me. I talked about guns a few weeks ago. How excited am I about finding a new scripture as, or, or a new meaning in the scripture as I am about finding a new gun? So that, that's something that, what fires you up? What makes you excited? Do I watch, do I play on my phone? Do I watch Netflix as much as I read my Bible? I'm going to go ahead and tell you I don't. Are y'all listening to me? Most of you saw my wife posted. I didn't know she was going to do it. I've started going back to school to get my master's. So now my life is, you ever seen them people who, who spin plates at the, at the fair and at the carnival? I've added another plate to spin, right? And somehow or the other, I still find time to waste time. Y'all ain't listening to me. I'm sure all of y'all are good stewards of your time. You don't waste any time. I still find time to waste time. And it's time for me to do a little growing up. Christian, it's time for you to grow up. Spiritual infants, as I mentioned, are more concerned with argument than action. So the next time, so here's a litmus test. The next time something happens at church you don't agree with, instead of arguing with somebody about it, what are you going to do about it? Arguments over actions. Listen, I, I still fail regularly, okay? And I'm going to talk about this a little later on in my sermon, but I don't fight about stuff just to say I'm right anymore. Now, especially if you're a married couple, you ought to listen to me very carefully. I don't fight just to say I'm right anymore. I don't, and that's biblical. That's biblical. Let me give you an example. King David. Everybody thinks of King David as a little shepherd boy who played the harp to God, and he's just a sweet psalmist of Israel, and the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart, and all that stuff was true. But when he went to carry cheese to his brothers at the battlefield like his daddy told him to, when he got there, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And then he, they said, well, we're trying, nobody will kill him. And what, is, what does the sweet psalmist of David say? Does anybody know? David says, what will be done for the man that kills him? 
David didn't kill Goliath out of the goodness of his heart. Did y'all know that? They, David, they told David, they said, you don't have to pay taxes the rest of your life and you get to marry the king's daughter. He said, I believe I can whip that boy for that. That's in the Bible. Go home and look it up. So quit fighting. Watch this. That same story, David got to the battlefield and his brothers said, boy, what are you doing down here and who'd you lead them few little sheep with you have? And the Bible says David said nothing to them. But he said to one of the commanders, what will be done for the man who kills this uncircumcised Philistine who talks against the name of the Lord? So he didn't argue with his brothers where there was, there was no, he could have argued with his brothers, but he would have only been arguing to be right. Why don't you take a lesson from that? Quit fighting over stuff that there's no fight in, that there's no spoils, there's no reward just to say you're right. So, <clears throat> so. Thankfully, so this is a real life example. Winnie has proven to me that she is trustworthy and loyal and, and she glows in the dark and she's the best thing since sliced bread. But anytime I disagree with her, very rarely do I look at her and say, no. And some of y'all are thinking, well, that's what you want to say is, is yes, ma'am. But I have learned, and, and I've done this before. I've looked at my wife and, and did this. I've said, I know you're right and I don't like it. But I've quit fighting over stuff just to say I'm right because some things are not worth <coughs> some things are not worth fighting over. And the Christians that are worried about argument over action, when we major in the minors and minor in the majors, I've used the illustration before. If the church, <coughs> pardon me, excuse me. If, if something happened in the church and, and all of y'all came to me and, and posted on social media, if all of y'all decided you wanted to paint the, the walls and the ceilings black and put glitter in it. I, I, I don't care. You're going to ask my opinion about it, and I'm going to say, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to paint? Because Ken's not. No, 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 Lord, please don't make me paint. Um, Ken doesn't intend to. I quit saying what I will and will not do, okay? Um, and and um, when, when do y'all want to do it? I have a preference, Right? Watch this. Be careful as a Christian you don't make your preference the gospel. Y'all ain't listening to me. Be careful you don't make your preference the gospel. Make sure the gospel is the gospel. And not just have arguments over actions. It's time for the American church to grow up. Spiritual babies are more concerned with how they feel about something than what the Bible says about something. So I have had church business meetings when I announce weeks ahead of time, we're going to get together and we're going to talk about this and this and this and we're going to talk about our finances and I will say this and I'll say this again and I say it with a smile and I'm going to say I do not care what your mama would have thought about what we're getting ready to do. Your mama's gone on to glory and what your mama might have said about this is not in the Bible. So do not stand up at church and say, well, I'll tell you what mama would have thought about this. I don't care. And the church doesn't care what your mama would have thought about what we're doing. Is what we're doing, is it biblical? Does it line up with our church polity with, with what we believe. Now listen, if it's, if it's anti-biblical, if it's heresy, if it's things like that, but people want to fight over preferences. They want to fight over preferences, and that is a red flag of spiritual immaturity. Don't let your preferences become gospel. It is time for us to understand that spiritual babies are more concerned about what they think and how they feel versus what the Bible says about something. You've all heard it said, when it's all said and done, there's a lot more said than done. And that is so true in the church. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. We pay someone to cut the grass at church. <laughs> Praise God. We, pray some, we pay somebody to clean the church. Praise the Lord. And you know what? The next church work day we have, and two people show up out of 60 people, we're not having another church work day. We're going to pay somebody to come and, and pressure wash and do all the stuff because you have told me you have voted with your feet and your money, and you've told me I cannot go to church and work on a church work day. So you have told me you have voted. Whether you held your hand up and said, we're going to do this or not, you have voted and told me. I'm not calling you spiritually immature because we're all busy. Right? But you've told me by your actions, words, and deeds, I'm not coming to church. So then I'm probably going to stand up the Sunday before the work day and say, we're going to take up a special offering to help pay for the pressure washing. 
it's quiet in here. But I'm trying to help you see where the rubber meets the road. And Christianity is more than 1045 to 12 o'clock when you feel like it. And, it's, and if the church can afford to pay for it, I think we should continue to do so. Anybody here free on a Saturday? You want to just come mow the grass for funsies? Because I guarantee you're not going to mow the grass the way I want it mowed. Some of y'all thinking, how's Kim want it mowed? This is supposed to be the house of the king of kings. And just because you're volunteering don't mean you can do a halfway job on it. I need to smile when I say certain things. Right? Well, it's just for the church. It's my, I'm volunteering. Then stop. People will say, you can't fire a volunteer. I've fired volunteers before. Some of y'all think, I can't believe Ken is talking about this. this listen, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road, Christianity. I'm trying to push you into thinking beyond your own self a little bit. I'm trying to push me into thinking beyond my own self and help me to grow up a little. And everything you're offended by, ask yourself, why am I offended by it? Is it unbiblical or is it a preference? We've all seen the time church folks will grumble and complain and go on and on about something the way it was done at church, but they are nowhere to be seen when it's time to do it, help do it, or give towards it. I just mentioned this earlier. You vote with your money and you vote with your feet. So if you don't show up and you don't give to it, you're telling me you don't support it. And do not complain about something that you don't help do. I've been in churches that people didn't like the bulletin. Okay. See Sister Smith. You can help her. She runs the bulletin every Sunday. And they get that look on their face like a cow looking at a new gate like, I don't want to help do the bulletin. Then what are you complaining about? What, 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 what are you... I, I, don't, I don't like the cleaner. I don't like the smell of the, I don't like the kind of chemicals they use in the restrooms to clean the restrooms at church. Well, they sell them at the Piggly Wiggly. They sell them at the Dollar General. They sell them at Walmart. You go buy any chemical you want and donate it to the church, and we'll use that chemical next time. Y'all ain't listening to me. We all need to grow up a little bit and quit, quit majoring in minors. I wish... Church people, not, not this church, but I wish church people would get as upset about, about souls as they do about stupid stuff. Mm. I wish church people as a whole would get more upset about souls than they do stupid stuff. The amount of people, you can't get people to call other people and check on them. But honey, if we decided to, to paint the walls black and put glitter in it, some of y'all going to become the unofficial prayer line because you're going to be calling everybody you know to say, you ain't going to believe what they're doing at that church. I can't get you to call nobody to check on them, but honey, something you don't like, you're going to pick up that phone or you're going to start blasting on social media. I'm preaching. Now, I, I ain't preaching about Bible text right now, but I'm preaching. I'm telling the truth because you're immature and don't understand your role in the kingdom. That we would get just as upset and excited about souls as we do about stuff that we don't like. One of the most expensive things in this world is your time and your elbow grease. One of the most expensive things in this world is your time and your elbow grease. Please understand there's nothing wrong with pointing out errors correctly and discreetly. But I'm talking about those who find fault and go on and on and on and never have anything positive to say. There are some Christians who their official prayer, excuse me, their official spiritual gift is complaining. And just in case y'all don't know your Bible, complaining is not a real spiritual gift. But it seems like that's their official spiritual gift. Ken, are you sure nobody's made you upset at church? No, 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 no. No one's made me. I don't have any feelings anymore. I've been pastoring too long to have feelings. But no one has, has upset me at church. Nobody's got me fired up about something they said or didn't say at Goshen. I've just, I started preaching on this in February, and we're going to continue talking about Christians. It's time for us to grow up. Spiritual babies are those that want, to be, that want to point out a problem and be given credit for pointing out the problem, but do not want to be part of the solution. It's almost like some people are not happy unless they are unhappy and mad about something. <clears throat> the Lord is whispering it's time for all of us to grow up. This is sermon is for those that are saved and who have stopped serving him or those who have never served him in church. 
It is those that have been saved a long time and those that have been saved a short amount of time. It is for those that think church is a place of convenience as long as it makes them happy and it's time for Christians to grow up. Watch this. Most pastors and teachers focus on the sin of commission. They tell you what you should do and shouldn't do and why you shouldn't do it and what the Bible says about it. And, and, and commission is a big, fat, hairy deal. Most pastors and Christians focus on the sin of commission, but we should be careful that we are not committing the sin of omission, the sin of omission. If we're not careful, we judge and look down on those committing sins, which would be a sin of commission, but we turn a blind eye or not spiritually mature enough to realize we're supposed to be doing something as Christians, we are sinning by omission. The act of not doing something you're supposed to do is sinning. I don't have the scripture reference in the system, but the Bible specifically says for him to know to do right and do it not, it is a, a sin. Another largely overlooked sin in the church and Christianity is the sin of strife. Not only is strife in many churches, but many Christians fall prey to strife. Strife is sneaky and subtle, but when we grumble, murmur, and complain, and that's the majority of what we do, then we are falling prey to strife. And not only do we strive, strive for terrible things in Christianity, but the majority of time, humans in general waste a bunch of money, resources, and energy complaining, murmuring, and grumbling about things that have no eternal significance. I, I, I mentioned that before. Um, <clears throat> there are, our, our light bill is high. Our, our light bill is high at church. I, and, and, and most of you all, you probably can figure out if your light bill's high, if we turn all this stuff on, because we, and, and you may be thinking, every time I come in here in the summer, it's hot, and every time I come in here in the winter, it's cold. Well, there's as many people on this side that come in and say, every time I come in in the summer, it's cold, and every time I come in the winter, it's hot. I, I've often joked, if, if I were ever a pastor as part of a building program, I would put a bunch of vents up on the, the pulpit on the stage and have my own system just so I could be cool on the stage to try to help keep other people comfortable. It, it amazes me that the, the, the good Christian church people have been saved 40, 50 years, and they sit in the same spot, and the same spot has an uh, a heat, uh, air conditioning register beside it, and they complain every week that it was cold during the summer. Move, Bertha. Wear some more rags to church. Bring a blanket. We do not have the, Miss Kathy, she'll joke and sometimes say, Woo, is the air conditioning on Blizzard? But she's joking about it. But there are, some, there are some people, they imply they couldn't get anything out of the service because they were too cold. Move. I'm too hot. It's too hot in here. We have... Listen, as a minister of a church, you have families from all different demogra demographics, and the people who are on blood thinners and who are or who might be sickly, it takes more heat to keep them comfortable than it does. So have you considered there may be some sickly or older people in here that might need to be a little more comfortable than you are? And we have sweat for thousands of years. Why, why is sweating a little? You sweat at work. Unless you work in the cold storage at the at the at the warehouse at the, some of these places, you you sweat at work. Why why are you worried about? Well, I got my good go to meeting clothes on. Well, don't wear so many rags. Please wear enough, but don't. It, it has always kind of tickled me. Can I be honest with y'all? That that church culture expects men to wear suits and ties and long sleeve shirts, and women have started wearing nothing. And the women are always the one that's coldest, wearing the least amount of clothes. Has anybody ever done? Come on now. I, I. But if Sister Bertha would be as upset about the people that used to come to the church that aren't going to church anymore, she is about air conditioning, church wouldn't have enough room for her to slide over. 
And the same thing for me. I'm picking on Sister Bertha. Some of y'all here today thinking, now who's Bertha? I got to get one of them directories. Who's Bertha? He's talking about Bertha. There ain't no Bertha here. <laughs> I, I change names not because they're innocent, but because y'all are probably kin to them, and I don't want to say anybody's name out loud. If you, you don't think so, you say something about somebody in church, and you find out who they're kin to. They don't talk to each other, but you better not talk about my people. Mm, that's preaching. That's preaching too. Instead of majoring in the minors and minoring in the majors, that we find ourselves caught up in strife and envy and flat out sin. And I've told you before, that's the kind of mess that causes people to drive by and never stop. Because they say, if Christianity's like that, I can get that free at home. I can get that free at work. I can get that free. How many of y'all have figured out you can get a bad attitude for free almost anywhere you go nowadays? What tickles me is when, when <clears throat> they act like I'm inconveniencing them and I'm paying their salary. Like, I don't say that to them, but, but I, I come up with, with you know, $30 or $40 worth of goods. And, and let, me, let me tell y'all something. You're not fooling anybody when you're standing around doing this. Is there something wrong? What, what are you, you're playing on your phone, which, you know what? That's, that's between you and your employer. But when I walk up, don't suck in your teeth. What, are you hungry? Why are you sucking on your teeth for? I, I'm not up here to talk to you. Some of y'all are thinking, Ken, now you're supposed to be talking about maturing and growing up. I am talking about maturing and growing up. But Christians can act the same way. You would not believe the amount of Christians that get offended when you ask them to do something that the Bible says they should do in church. I'm, mm, I, mm, I got, no, no, I got plans. I don't know. What you got plans? You plan on sitting around in your pajamas is what you plan on doing. I don't feel, I don't feel lead. Well, here's a pencil. Here's some lead, right? When, when we were pastoring, it, it, it's so funny. When we were pastoring in Greenville, that was back when gas was getting up around 4 or $4.15. And we were right on a main thoroughfare in front of a gas station. And, honey, money was tight. Money was tight. It was. And, and it, it probably was tighter back then than it is, is now. But um, it never ceased to amaze me. And I'm not, hear me out now, I'm not preaching against boats, Okay. But the same, a lot of people who would complain about they don't have any money, when I'd get out of church and walk across the parking lot to the parsonage, that gas station was full of people with boats on the way home and on the way to the water. And you don't pull a boat with a Yugo, so you got to have something that'll pull, pull some weight too. And my mama said it like this, you do what you want to do. You do what you want to do. The people that, I'm broke, I can't afford to buy anything. Stop buying a $5 coffee on the way to work and a $5 coffee on the way home. I'm preaching. Quit, you, you're spending $10, you're spending $50 a week, you're spending $200 a month on coffee. Do you know you can make coffee at home? If you got the money, spend it. I'm talking about maturing and growing up. And you're thinking, Kim, what does that have to do with coffee? I've mentioned this before, but this is a spiritual truth. The big ticket items are important, but it's them pennies, them nickels, them dollars, and them dimes that get your bacon. Are you listening to me? How many of us are broke because we constantly say, well, it's only 99 cents. It's only $3.99. I have only $4 myself to death before. Or like Mr. Rogers said, it's on sale. Watch this, just because it's on sale don't mean you need it. The one I think about is the, the I've always wanted a, um, a real black leather lambskin old school World War II Ike cut bomber jacket with the, with the real wool fleece. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. I've always, I've always wanted one of those. The last time I checked, they were only about four or $500. <clears throat> Even if, I, even if I walked in and it was on clearance for $200 in my size, I wouldn't get it. You know why? I can only wear it one day a year in eastern North Carolina. 
the only long sleeve things I own are dress shirts. And I know you think, Ken, they, they, they make short sleeve dress shirts. I don't like them. I just don't like the way they feel. I just don't like them. I'm hot natured to begin with. So I can wear that coat one day a year. And I have not saved $600 on a coat if I get it on clearance for $200. If I can only wear it one day a year, I have spent $200. I have not saved $600. Are you listening to me? That's, that, that's just not good stewardship. That's not good stewardship. And if anybody wants to know my size, I'll tell you later if you feel led to buy your pastor one. Um, no, you better not spend that kind of money on a coat. I'm just playing. Uh, you better buy a gun. Um, <clears throat> Many, um, many pastors, uh, like I said, focus on commission, rather omission, but we have to pay attention to the sins of omission that we have a job to do. If you read your Bible, you will find out as a Christian you have, you have rights, but you also have responsibilities. It's very similar to, please, please forgive the, the simplicity of the illustration, as a United States citizen, there are some things you legally are supposed to do. Now, do not raise your hand because this, this service is being recorded. But if you don't pay your taxes, don't shout and say, yes, Lord, hallelujah, God has delivered me. You're supposed to pay your taxes. To be a citizen in good standing, you're supposed to pay your taxes. You're supposed to file an income tax. I mean, th there are certain parameters you don't have to. There are some that are retired and some people who don't make enough honor. I understand just enough about taxes to get in trouble. I was audited last year. I understand. It, it, it can be messy. You understand? It only took them nine months to give me that little bit of money that they owed me back. Um, they didn't find anything wrong. I mean, just in case y'all are audited, you know, the, the IRS pays interest. I think they paid us 3% interest on that little bit of money they owed us. Um, but they can have the interest because it was nine months. I was waiting nine months. For my, how many of y'all know I don't want to mess with the IRS and I don't want to mess with the game warden? You, you, <laughs> you understand? Um, th there's some people you want to stay away from. <clears throat> Winnie when she's mad. Okay? <laughs> Stay away from her. For us to understand that strife, the sins of commission and omission, that if you're not doing something in your church that you're supposed to be doing, you are sinning. Well, Ken, I'm, I'm retired. I'm close to retirement. I don't want to do it. I'm too young. I'm too old. If you can point to me in the scripture... And say, the Apostle Paul retired and officially had nothing else to do in church as a Christian, um, I, then we'll excuse you from Christian service. Ken, I don't appreciate you talking to retired people like that. I'm talking to everybody like that. But these are some of the excuses I've heard. I've heard this one. I retired from teaching school, and I'm not teaching Sunday school or anything else the rest of my life. I'm retired. I don't teach anymore. Okay. But you're living in disobedience. The sins of commission are just as important as the sins of omission. Strife is sneaky and subtle, sneaking in the church. And we need to be careful we're not wasting a bunch of money, resources, and energy complaining and grumbling about things that have no eternal significance. I'm beginning to learn as I mentioned earlier about David, I don't fight about things that have no reward. And I do not consider grumbling, murmuring, and complaining just to prove I'm right to be a good steward of my time. Because you know what I found out about um, a lie and grumbling and, and, and complaining? A lie and a complaint will go around the world twice before the truth gets its pants on. But if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, the truth's going to come out. I strive to not defend myself when I'm accused of something. Ken, what are you talking about? Um, how, many of you, how many of you have learned that sometimes you listen to people talk and you'll find out about stuff about yourself you didn't even know? I didn't know I did that. Any ever, anybody been there besides me? I didn't know I was there. I didn't know I did that because you didn't, right? But the, the Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, it makes even his enemies be at peace with him. So 
so, so when I've been accused or, or said I, I, I did do something or I didn't do something, depending on the circumstance and situation, I strive not to defend myself because unless it's going to hinder the ministry that God's called us to. Um, if you think I'm a terrible pastor, there's very little I'm going to do to change your mind. There's, there's, there's very little that can be done to change your mind and your heart. I've told you all this before, and I'll tell you this again. I've had people send me messages and even tell me, or call me and say, leave me alone. Do not send me another message. We miss you. Don't send us another card. Don't, don't send me another message saying we missed you at church. Leave me alone. And I'm kind of thick, and sometimes it takes that for me to go, oh, okay. So those people, without divine intervention, they're never going to see. They, I might be their preacher, but I'm never going to be their pastor. Are you listening to me? You can be somebody's preacher and never be their pastor. But I, I, I believe my philosophy of ministry is a minister should be a pastor and a preacher, not just a preacher. Because you can stay home and hear preaching that people pe preach the paint off the wall. You understand? But T.D. Jakes ain't going to do your wedding. Steve Furtick ain't going to do your funeral. Right? Rod Parsley ain't going to do your baby, bab baby dedication. You understand what I mean? Whoever your favorite, David Jeremiah ain't going ain't gonna to come to your baby shower. Who is the pastor in your life? If you're a Christian, you need to have a pastor. Well, Ken, I've been going to this church long. You've been alive, and I don't like you. Okay, I understand. Would you, uh, would you give me a chance? Let, 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 me, let, let me try again. Let me try again. Because strife and fighting and, it, listen, there's people dying and going to hell that go to church every Sunday. There are people dying and going to hell going to church every Sunday. Let us be very, very, very careful what we spend too much of our time on. Spiritual babies are selfish, self-centered. Spiritual babies want argument over action. Spiritual babies look to people rather than the Lord, and the Lord says it's time to grow up. Listen, <clears throat> please don't ever, and I don't think this is a big problem here uh, or in any church I've ever been in, but don't put a man or woman of God on a pedestal. You know why? Because they're going to fail. And some, the Bible says some men's sins go before them. Which means, as terrible as it sounds, for a minister who is still alive to be caught doing something that they're confronted with, at least they have the ability to repent of it. Some, some, some ministers, men of God, women of God, have been put on these pedestals that, 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 they're, that, that they are you know, the end all and be all. And, and people who have implied or, or even said... Um, I wish I wish you preach like Joyce Myers, or I, I wish you preach like T.D. Jakes, or uh, it's whether whether I want to be able to preach like T.D. Jakes or not, I'm never going to preach like T.D. Jakes. You understand? We can get an organ player over here, and I can say, "Get ready, get ready, get ready," ah, and it's never going to be the same because I'm not T.D. Jakes, right? It's just not going to happen. But don't put. And, and I'm not preaching against T.D. Jakes or anybody, Joyce Myers, whatever. Whatever fires you up. Don't put them on too high of a pedestal because men and women are still able to be fallible. We're still fallible creatures. And if you put someone on a pedestal, that, well, let me say it this way. There's a lot of Christians who no longer go to church anymore because the pastor, man or woman of God, they put on a pedestal, let them down. And watch this. It is perfectly normal to feel hurt when a man or woman of God over you lets you down. It's perfectly normal. But, but the ultimate master hung on a tree, and Jesus Christ is never going to let you down. You hear me? Jesus Christ never lets you down. He's never asleep. He's never late. He's never early. He's always right on time. God's never going to let you down. That's what, that's, what makes, that's what makes Christianity so awesome, is Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose from the dead as the perfect man and also the god man most people and i'm not picking on women but 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 most women when you you hem them up that one of the things they're looking for is the perfect man well the perfect man is jesus christ 
Um, and and far as men go, the Bible says that we are like the bride of Christ. The best friend you're ever going to have is Jesus. You might have your your siblings may be y'all may be thick as thieves, but your siblings are going to let you down. People are going to let you down, but Jesus Christ is never going to let you down. Jesus Christ is never going to let you down. And today, I want us to not look to people but rather look to the Lord because it's time for Christians to grow up and we're out of time. Stand up, please. Let's, let's pray together. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to come to your throne boldly, not by works that man should boast. Thank you, Father God, for saving our soul and delivering ourselves, Lord, delivering us from ourselves, Lord. Thank you, God, in Jesus' mighty name, that we can grow up in Christ, that we are no longer spiritual babies that seek the milk of the word, but we're able to receive what the word of God says to us and how it says to us. And with nobody looking around, if there's somebody here that doesn't know if they're saved or not, they'd like to receive Christ before we leave. If you'll raise your hand, I'm not going to call you out this morning. If there's anybody here who would like to raise their hand before we leave, I will not call you out. Is there anybody who would like to uh, just acknowledge that they need prayer for salvation or they're not sure of their salvation this morning then Lord I pray you bless and keep and be with your people make your face to shine upon them and bring them back to the next appointed time in Jesus mighty name amen bump elbows with two or three people